Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for being here um, for the talk this evening. Um, I would like to start by thanking some wonderful folks at the School of Business um, who've been extremely busy putting together all these talks, not just tonight in Kingston, but certainly um, we've been doing talks in Ottawa, Toronto, Calgary, Vancouver, New York, and in two weeks' time in London, England. To begin, I would like to st uh, start by telling you a personal story about an event that changed the course of my professional life. It's an event that no doubt played a major part in why I'm standing before you here tonight. 20 years ago, I was teaching a leadership course in the Queen's Exec MBA program in Ottawa. At the end of the class on transformational leadership, Tom Weber, a student in the class, approached me and asked if I would come and implement transformational leadership training in his organization. I was uncertain at that stage whether transformational leadership could be taught, so I declined. When Tom asked why, I explained that I saw myself more as an academic, research <coughs> academic researcher dedicated to developing new knowledge. It was then that Tom sighed and in words I will never forget, said, you know, that's the trouble with you academics. You're never willing to put your money where your mouth is. I was taken aback. So in exchange for my willingness to do one day of leadership training in his organization, Tom agreed to set up the ideal context in which we could rigorously test its effectiveness. Our deal was that if it didn't work, I could walk away. But if the leadership training was successful, I would have to rethink my original reluctance. Well, the training worked, and thanks to Tom, here I am. I set out to write the science of leadership for leaders in organizations. My goal in writing this book was to take what we've learned about organizational leadership from decades of research and what I've learned from my own involvement and experience in leadership training and create a book that was readable, interesting, and hopefully useful. One of the real delights for me in writing this book was the lessons that I learned along the way. So what I'd like to do now is share with you three what I think are big lessons that I learned, and these focus on women and leadership, where the leadership can be taught, and last, whether we can translate leadership theories into everyday leadership behaviors. So first, some thoughts about gender and leadership. Writing in the chapter on gender and leadership in this book had a profound effect on me. In fact, after I started working on this chapter, I almost could not stop. It's a fascinating and I think important issue for organizations and society. It's an issue that is full of paradoxes. And for better or for worse, these paradoxes have very significant implications for organizational functioning and effectiveness. Here is one paradox. After decades of research across many different countries, we know that women as a group are somewhat more likely than men as a group to display transformational and participative and democratic leadership, and yes, there would be many exceptions to this rule. In contrast, men as a group are somewhat more likely to, to display autocratic or laissez-faire leadership than women. What this means is that women as a group are somewhat more likely than men as a group to display the very leadership behaviors that are linked with more positive outcomes. The opposite is true for men. So despite all these findings, women are still significantly less likely than men to attain meaningful leadership positions in organizations. Remarkably, both in Canada and the United States, only 5% of the top 500 companies have a female CEO. If we broaden our focus, Catalyst, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to expanding opportunities for women in business, estimates that women held about 14% of senior corporate office, officer positions in the top financial post corporations in Canada in 2002. 11 years later, that figure was 18%. So for those of you who are currently trying to do the math in your heads, let me help. That's an increase of about 0.4% per year, enough to get us to gender parity around about the turn of the century. Extend this to membership of boards of governance, and Catalyst estimates that in Canada in, about two, in 2013, only about 14% of board seats were occupied by women. The depth of this problem becomes even more clear 
when we realize that only 3% of all board positions are held by women of color, and only 4% of board chair positions are occupied by women. In the United States, the percentage of women CEOs of Fortune 500 companies has certainly more than doubled over the past decade or so. But that's only because there were 21 female CEOs in the top 500 companies in 2013, which is up from seven in 2003. And this congratulatory quote from a journalist by the name of Bryce Covert tells us how nothing much has really changed. In a recent comment, he said the following. With the recent naming of Lynn Good as the new CEO of the utility Duke Energy, the number of women at the helm of a Fortune 500 company rose by 4%. But that 4% increase was achieved with the addition of one new female CEO. And of the 22 female CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, only two are held by women of color. When considering how to describe the amount of change in executive officer positions in Fortune 500 companies in um, recent years, Catalyst chose to use the word stagnate. Last, if we look at the percentage of Fortune 500 board seats occupied by women um, in 1995, it was 9.6%. And by 2013, it is 16.9%. And again, if you're doing the math in your head, that's an increase of 7.3% over 18 years, um, enough to get us to gender parity again by the turn of the century. <clears throat> what about gender representation in the political realm? In Canada, 76 of the 308 seats in the House of Commons are held by women. At just under 25%, that's the highest proportion in Canada's history. In the United States, no more than 19% of members of Congress and 20% of members of the Senate are women. And that means that we lag behind the United Kingdom, Australia, Germany, France, and let me carry on, Rwanda, Cuba, Iceland, Tanzania, Burundi, and the United Arab Emirates. And the list does go on, but we'll stop here. So given this, you must be thinking by now that surely there is a groundswell of support demanding immediate change. As Maggie Wilderotter, who is chairman and CEO of Frontier Communications, and whom we will meet again soon, um, said recently, Catalyst's 2013 census, showing the continued shortage of women in, in America's C-suites, board of directors, and, um, and CEOs, is a call to action. Well, not so much. A recent survey of senior Canadian executives included two really revealing questions. First, they were asked, how concerned are you about the number of women on boards and in senior management at Canadian corporations? 58% were either not at all or not very concerned. But that just reflects their broad impressions so they were then asked a far more specific question. Are you satisfied with the number of women in your company's executive ranks? And fully 64% said that they're satisfied. The results from a survey of 400 Canadian executives conducted this year by Environics for the Queen's School of Business casts further light on this issue. 70% of the executives surveyed significantly overestimated the number of corporate board members who are women. Um, they were then given the correct information. And upon being told that in fact, no more than 15% of corporate board members in Canada are women, nearly two thirds of the respondents opposed any kind of notion of mandatory quotas to change the situation. I should note that support for mandatory quotas was not surprisingly lower amongst men and anybody holding the title of CEO or president. Although I'm often accused of being an incurable optimist, I have my struggles with this issue. All of this is not just an issue of fairness, as important as that is. It's an issue that affects organizations in visible and less visible ways. It's an issue of an opportunity missed and an opportunity wasted. What do young female school children learn when they look up and dream about the future, as all school children do. They see a world in which the odds are stacked against them rising to the top. And how might this affect their motivation 
to become leaders in the future. Think of the subtle reminders of gender, st gender stereotypes that permeate our organizations. For example, the ever-present pictures of male CEOs and organizational legends in atriums and boardrooms. I recently worked with the senior team of a large um, multinational organization based in Australia, and we did this via video conferencing. There were 10 people in the room that uh, we were working with, two of whom were women. When I mentioned the example of how pictures of male luminaries serve as a continual reminder of gender stereotypes, there was laughter in that room. It turns out that in the room they were sitting, there were pictures all around their boardroom, and all were pictures of men. Why is this so important? A fascinating study from the University of Waterloo shows that when young female undergrads are subtly reminded of gender stereotypes, they become substantially less interested in assuming a leadership role. But when these same female undergrads were explicitly told that there are no gender differences in leadership effectiveness, they became as interested in assuming a leadership role as their male counterparts. An intriguing family points us in an entirely different direction. Recall, recall that earlier on, I mentioned Maggie Wilderotter, um, who is chairman and CEO of Frontier Communications, and before that was a senior VP at Microsoft. And Maggie R Wilderotter is one of the four Sullivan sisters, and you should Google the Sullivan sisters. So one of her younger sisters is Colleen Bastkowski, who was a regional VP at Expedia after holding the position of director of sales at AT&T, where she is, in a sense, known because she doubled productivity and revenue growth. Their baby sister is Andrea Dooling, who was senior VP at AT&T Wireless, where she received a major Best Boss Award and is a champion horse jumper, show jumper. Oh, and their eldest sister is Denise Morrison, who was the CEO and president of Campbell Soup. Given the statistical probability of this, might there be an important lesson in here somewhere? Or did the four Sullivan sisters just win the genetic sweepstakes? Well, the sisters don't think so. They all recall the powerful influence of their parents. Dinner discussions invariably revolved around business and leadership, and the parents' determination that when the children had dreams, they would, the dreams would be matched with workable business plans. And they all recall that their mom would always insist, and I quote, that ambition is part of being feminine. Nothing in the Sullivan sisters' childhood experiences could be further from the continual reminder to young girls that their opportunities for leadership are limited. If we turn to a truly large-scale and innovative research study in India, um, it involved 500 randomly selected villages, sorry, 500 villages, and from each village, 15 households were randomly selected, and this study will show us the value of being exposed to a female role model. Young girls who had consistently been exposed to a female head of the village council were more motivated to stay in school longer and were more interested in pursuing a career. And both their mothers and their fathers showed higher aspirations for their daughters if they lived in a village that had been headed by a female um, head of the council. But for me, the most remarkable finding from the study was that their fathers were now more interested in their daughters assuming leadership positions. There are so many prescriptions for change, from leaning in through to legislation, all of which seem to attract unthoughtful criticism, often not because of any rigorous evaluation of the particular method, but perhaps more because of the fear that it might just work. So what initiatives are we likely to see in the future? I think we're likely to see initiatives that revolve around the notion of what we might call voluntary compliance. As one example, the Catalyst organization has just started an intriguing program in Canada, inviting organizations to become signatories to the Catalyst Accord, a public commitment to ensure that 25% of all board seats are, are held by women by the year 2017. Peer pressure may well ensure that, the success, that this initiative is successful, because Catalyst has started placing ads in major newspapers naming signatories to the accord. So with public recognition that the Royal Bank, the Bank of Montreal, 
CIBC, Scotiabank, and HSBC have all signed on the accord, can TD be far behind? With WestJet already a signatory, um, in a sense, will Air Canada perhaps be next? And might this approach, be, might this approach work? Because it takes us from a, a, a situation of voluntary compliance through to what we might call naming and shaming. With organizations desperately seeking the next generation of the highest potential leaders, we can no longer limit ourselves to keep on looking to the same old groups while hoping for demographically different outcomes. Successful organizations will be those that voluntarily choose to create environments that respect, reward, develop, and promote male and female leaders, creating a larger and richer pool of talent from which to draw their future leadership. These are the organizations that will attract and retain high-quality women leaders. The time for debate about gender and leadership is over, and both social and organizational functioning demand that action be taken now. Still, an appropriate place to end this discussion on gender diversity and leadership is to point out that this is just the tip of a very unstable iceberg. Questions about people of color in leadership and religious minorities in leadership have yet to enter corp the corporate co consciousness about leadership in any meaningful way. But these are the issues that our organizations will confront in the future. What I'd like to turn now is to a different question, and that's the question of whether leadership can be taught. In all of the talks I give on leadership and on leadership training, um, one, of the most, one of the two most frequent questions I get asked is whether leadership is born or made. The other question, by the way, is almost invariably whether Barack Obama is a transformational leader. For those of you whose interest is piqued by this question, the answer is the same as that contained in a wonderful story told of the late Chinese Premier, Zhou Enlai. Um, when asked in the late 1970s what his, his impression was of the French Revolution, Zhou Enlai wisely responded, I don't know, it's too soon to tell. But I digress. Why would the question of whether leadership is born or made be so important? Because when we look at amazing leaders, such as Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, or Mother Teresa, we tend to stand in awe of them and assume that leadership must be something that they were born with. And if that is indeed the case, we would be precluded from doing much to help people develop their leadership skills and behaviors. Fortunately, we now know that no more than about 30% of the variation in who becomes a leader is genetic. Given that successful organizations depend on the continued availability of high quality leaders, what options are available to us? One currently popular approach is to, in the, to ensuring the continued availability of high quality leaders is to recruit the best available talent. I start with a different premise, and that is that organizations will never be able to meet their leadership needs in a comprehensive and timely manner by relying primarily on attracting and recruiting the most talented leaders. This strategy has several critical weaknesses. It'll demoralize aspiring leaders within the organization by reminding them that their commitment and skills are not valued and that their opportunities are limited. It is a strategy that is unlikely to retain high quality leaders and is probably unsustainable in the long term. So then can leadership be taught? And can organizations develop their own leaders? The news here is certainly encouraging. Will it surprise you to learn that there are hundreds of research studies conducted all over the world in public and private sectors, in large, medium, and small businesses, unionized and non-unionized workplaces, in which the effects of leadership training have been evaluated? And will it surprise you to learn that the results of these studies conducted over decades show that leadership skills or behaviors can indeed be taught, and that this can be accomplished in workshops lasting no more than a day. And the results may be even more optimistic than that. One recent study in a nationwide Swiss organization showed that charisma could be taught to middle managers in a training session lasting only five hours that was followed by one hour of a personalized telephone conversation in which a leadership plan was developed. How do we know that the training was effective? Because three months later, later 
Leader, peer, and subordinate ratings of these leaders' charisma were evaluated as significantly higher than a comparable group who had not received the one-day training session. The same research team then extended this by providing 20 hours of similar leadership training to a different group of leaders. What did they learn? The additional 15 hours of training brought diminishing benefits, suggesting that we may be prone to overestimate what it takes to teach leadership skills and behaviors. So why do we do this? I think we overestimate what really constitutes wonderful leadership. We would do well to remember that the best of leadership is not about what extraordinary people accomplish by themselves. Instead, the best of leadership is about the smallest things that leaders do to inspire their employees. First, to believe that they can accomplish amazing things given sufficient effort. Second, to see that their work is, has a meaningful impact on other people. And last, to value the working relationship that they have with their leaders. Recognizing that this is wonderful leadership calls attention to a huge problem. Because we know that leadership can be taught, and efficiently too, I think we must be very concerned about the dominant industry practice regarding leadership development, in which leadership development training is invariably offered only after someone becomes a leader, a long, usually a long time after they become a leader, and then invariably only to those loyal leaders of the highest potential. One of the strangest things that I've learned is that opportunities to participate in leadership development initiatives in most organizations is less about developing leadership and more about rewarding those leaders who are already doing a really good job. Organizations are generally very hesitant to devote their time and resources to leaders who need the development the most. Surprisingly, organizations become really risk averse when it comes to investing in leadership and leadership development. What is called for is nothing less than a total change in how we approach leadership development. Ensuring that the organizational need for leadership is met requires that a wide talent pool be identified and then continually nurtured, developed and expanded long before people are ever allowed to step into such an important role. So why is such common sense not common practice? For one thing, organizations remain concerned that they would not realize a sufficient return on their investments devoted to the training. Yet research shows that not only are these leadership workshops effective, they are usually cost effective too, sometimes doubling the initial, develop, initial investment. Second, organizations are concerned that if they taught leadership skills and behaviors prior to people taking on those positions, and then they were not promoted, they would take their newly learned leadership skills elsewhere, potentially investing, therefore, in the training of the next generation of their competitors' leadership. But this should not be a concern. Research shows that, if anything, offering such training may be more likely to make people want to stay in that organization. Why? Because employees are looking for organizations that will invest in them, that will show loyalty to them, and then they will most likely want to reciprocate in kind. Third, perhaps we're asking the wrong question entirely. We should be less concerned by asking, what happens if we develop leaders and they leave? And a lot more concerned with what happens if we don't develop our own leaders and they stay? What future will these organizations face? Looking to the future, if we know that leadership can be taught and that the challenge is to reach people well before they ever become leaders, I look forward to the day when leadership skills and behaviors are taught to our school children, both boys and girls, during their most impressionable years. To conclude these thoughts on whether leadership can be taught, internet technologies offer exciting opportunities to extend the reach of leadership training to meet the needs of many more people in ways and in places that were previously considered unthinkable. Webinars delivered through video conferencing or booster sessions conducted via smartphones are already possible, and many of these technologies will enable leadership development interventions to be personalized in ways that are incompatible with the traditional delivery to large groups of people sitting in a classroom. 
I think we can safely predict that the future of leadership development will somehow look very different from what we know of it today. Moving away from a discussion of explicit initiatives to develop our current and future lessons, I would last like to consider what I think is the most optimistic, personal and practical lesson I've learnt about leadership. If you were looking for new knowledge about leadership as a guide to your everyday behaviours and turn to the literature on leadership theories as a guide, I suspect you would throw up your arms in horror and probably run a mile. Transformational leadership, authentic leadership, servant leadership. I even re read a recent article on ambidextrous leadership. <laughs> Somehow, Academics have a habit of translating observations about everyday behavior into abstract theories that are usually unintelligible to all except a very small in-group. In contrast to this, my fascination has always been on the intersection of theory and practical behavior and on how we can use this intersection to inform everyday leadership behaviors. And this is what I've learned. Despite the belief by many leaders that they need to display wonderful leadership all the time, this is neither possible nor necessary. It is simply not possible because most leaders are not physically co-located with their followers most of their time. In the globalized workplace, they may not even be in the same time zone or same country as the people they lead. And it is not necessary because in truth, faced by a leader who was inspirational or empathic all the time, employees would probably be totally overwhelmed and probably terrified. Employees do not expect their leaders to do the impossible all the time. Instead, they will judge their leaders by what they choose to do, but didn't have to do. And equally, they will judge their leaders what they could have done, but chose not to do. So the leadership challenge is not whether you can sustain wonderful leadership all the time with all your employees. The leadership challenge is what you choose to do at the right time during those few precious moments in which you have the opportunity to make a real difference. Those moments in which you can help employees see and appreciate their strengths, not yours, understand how important their work is, not yours, and treasure the working relationships they have with their leaders and their peers. The most important practical lesson I've learned from all of this is that it is the smallest things that leaders choose to do at the right time that has the most meaningful outcomes, and the evidence for this is mounting. In one study of fundraisers who were effectively working in a call center operation, all employees received performance feedback at the end of the day. But some groups were also visited by a director of fundraising who simply told employees, in addition to their performance feedback, and I'm going to quote, I am very grateful for your hard work. We sincerely appreciate your contribution to the organization. 16 words. Yet the small expression of gratitude was sufficient to increase the number of calls made by 50%, five zero, in the next week. Separate research has shown that similarly small levels of gratitude can have the same enormous effects when expressed via email. And the lessons don't only come from leadership research, they are everywhere we look. Two stories about Nelson Mandela's leadership are certainly worth sharing. If you saw the movie Invictus, you may remember that almost daily, Mandela would go on a long early morning walk. As he returned one morning, some young children were playing nearby, and one of the children ducked under the bodyguards and started appealing to Mandela. Mr. Mandela, Mr. Mandela, it's my birthday. Please come to my party. Later that afternoon, there was a knock on the door of this family's home in what we might call an apartheid white neighborhood. And when the mother opened the door, there was Mandela. What are you doing here? Asked the mother. To which Mandela replied, oh, your son invited me to his birthday party. <laughs> Mandela spent about a half an hour at the party, shocking everybody in attendance, and then he left. Another Mandela story. A young 12-year-old Jewish boy was approaching his bar mitzvah ritual and kept telling his parents that he wanted to invite Mr. Mandela to the celebrations. Of course, his parents scoffed at this idea, but he knew what to do, and he turned to his grandmother for help. Together, they prepared an invitation, went to Mandela's house, and left the invitation with one of the bodyguards. 
A day before the party, the family learned that Mandela would indeed attend the dinner for a short while. The family were asked to tell nobody about this, and um, when Mandela arrived, he stunned everybody who was in attendance and congratulated the young boy, his families, and all the guests. So what was Mandela doing, and what do these stories teach us? Mandela always knew that leadership is not about making those people who love you, love you. Leadership to Mandela was, all about, was always all about getting those people who questioned everything about his beliefs and his values to start questioning their own. Leadership for Mandela was not about drawing his supporters closer, it was about drawing his opponents closer. Mandela was a genius at doing the smallest things among people who were not support necessarily supportive of his, of his values and beliefs, drawing them closer by getting them to question their own beliefs. Parenthetically, I should note that the second story does not end here. Each week for many years afterwards, Mandela would receive numerous invitations from around South Africa to attend bar mitzvah celebrations. <laughs> but is it only leaders like Mandela who can provide small acts of leadership of such enormous magnitude? John Meacham, a presidential historian in the United States, asked how it was that the non-charismatic George Herbert Walker Bush, aka Bush Senior, managed to become president in 1988. Meacham reminds us that Bush Sr. had already served as vice president for eight years, as the director of the CIA for a year, as the ambassador to the United Nations for two years, and ambassador to China for 14 months. In all of these roles, Bush made a habit of sending people thank you cards when they did something out of the ordinary, leaving very large numbers of people feeling very positively disposed towards him. When it came to the presidential election, Meacham says that George Herbert Walker Bush became president one thank you card at a time. Returning to Canada, who is the greatest prime minister we ever had? When John Diefenbaker was visiting the small prairie town of Notre Dame in the late 1970s, he encountered a young Jason Kenney who was about nine years old at the time. They spoke briefly about whether young Jason liked school and other similarly important topics. A young Jason Kenney wrote to thank the former Prime Minister and in return received a handwritten note and photograph. Attending a fundraising debate in Ottawa last year, about 35 years after meeting Diefenbaker, now Minister Jason Kenney stoutly defended John Diefenbaker as Canada's greatest Prime Minister ever. Last, a wonderful story that political consultant and columnist Warren Kinsella has shared about Jean Chrétien. Kinsella says, when I worked for Jean Chrétien, I always noted that he entered fancy political dinners in the same way, through the kitchen. He'd stop in the kitchen and thank all the staff and talk to them and pose for pictures. And then Kinsella noted, around Ottawa, the cab drivers and messengers and secretaries all supported, Kinsella, it all supported Chrétien first because he was nice to them. So to conclude, yes, wonderful leaders dream about achieving big things. They dream about achieving great things. But they know better than anyone else that they can only get there by doing one small little thing at a time. Thank you very much.